there is no way any of you made it all the way through that marks video if you did i wish there was some way i could reward you i hope you're learning how to pause and come back to these videos right i'm sorry they're so torturous i hope you're finding the best in them again i'm really sad that we have to teach online like this i wish we could take this class in person but i will try to make this online version as good as I can. I'm sorry that you're taking the class this way and I can't be with you. Anyway, so now we're going to turn to Marcuse. Marcuse is another one of these critical thinkers, some of my favorite modern thinkers. And something needs to be said about Marcuse and Fromm right here. Please notice their history. A lot of the critical thinkers, like uh, Hannah Arendt that we'll read in a little bit, a lot of these critical thinkers fled Nazi Germany when Hitler came to power. And here's what's fascinating about Fromm and Marcuse. They come to the United States fleeing the insanity of Nazism and Hitler. And what do they write about mostly? How crazy Americans are. Oh, that should hurt us. These are people that fled the insanity of Hitler's fascism, come to the United States and said, these people have serious mental health problems. These are serious conformists. That's terrifying. All right. So we're going to draw another picture. Some of you are saying, finally, this year, these are the best parts of this class. Others of you are saying, I hate these drawings. So we'll try to make them a little quicker for the latter group, right? If you really like drawing, oh, please keep doing it. But the drawing does help. So make sure you're doing the drawing. So we're going to have two characters today. We're going to have a little tangential aside and talk about a little issue and then go on to our third labor structure dealing with the modern manager class. All right, so let's start with Herbert, the middle class American dog. I am in New Mexico right now, so let's put him in New Mexico. There he is. There's Herbert. By the way, we're naming him Herbert. If you haven't noticed, all of these are references to the philosopher's names we're dealing with. When we called George Carpenter, George the Carpenter George, that was a reference to George Hegel. When we called Carl the coal miner Carl, that was for Karl Marx. This is now Herbert the dog because that is Marcuse's first name, Herbert Marcuse. All right. So there he is. We'll put him in his yard. Now, we don't want to build a big fence because we want our beautiful xeriscaped landscape to be beautiful for the neighbors to see. And so we give him an invisible fence dog collar. You know how these work, right? They will shock him if he goes outside of some periphery. And this is a special one. I think I should market this. This will call the trademark bad faith copyright bad faith invisible fence dog collar. We will see why in a little bit. All right, now let's see. We want our middle class dog to be happy. So we're going to think about his needs. Now, yes, of course, these are going to be all analogies, right, for our needs. But think of a dog. We want our dog to be happy. So what does he need? Well, first, of course, he needs his physiological needs. So there's food and water, right? So there's water sitting out in the hot sun. There is some kibble made from horse, probably dog or whatever, right? Sorry, Herbert, right? Hopefully it's chicken and rice, right? Dogs are carnivores. And there he is, so he has food and water. Now, what does he need? He needs territory. All right, so right there, obviously, I'm super good at drawing. There's a fire hydrant. He can whiz on this, and there's his territory. What else does he need? He needs shelter, so we give him a dog house. Now, by the way, are most of these things really for Herbert? Do they make him happy? No, they're about us so we can feel like we're making him happy. That's why here, let's put an H on his little dog house, right? Can he read? No. So is the dog house for him or for us? Really for us, so we can feel like we're a cute little dog owner. All right, so there's his shelter. So he can sit under there in the super baking hot sun of New Mexico. Uh, by the way, when I am home, and almost, someone is almost always home at my house, we have a couple dogs, and they're almost never alone. Your dog's always alone. I can hear them howling all day long. Now, of course, you get home from work, and they're happy to see you, but they are miserable all day in their super hot backyard, right? You guys are terrible to your dogs. Anyway, let's go back to the story. What else does he need? Um, okay, he needs to run around. He needs to chase things, right? 
Now, you will say that he likes to play. Dogs like to play, but it's really hunting, right? Dogs are little hunters, so what do we do? We go to PetSmart and get him some carcinogenic polystyrene rosin-filled Fifi the Chew toy, right? There he is. Good. And so what do we do? We throw this to him. That's his, like, we could even say it's maybe his companionship. We'll see. Right? But what does he do? He chews this thing. He plays with this thing. Right? It's his form of hunting. Now what does he need? Well, he needs more than that. He needs some, you would say, exercise. I hate that word for it. Right? He just wants to hunt and play, but we think he needs exercise. That's the artificial version. So we build him a little dog run on the side. Yeah, as if he's just going to run back and forth in this little enclosed space, and that's going to be his exercise. But again, we don't want to ruin our beautiful little landscaping, so we give him a little corner called a dog run. No one can run in that space, but we think we're doing a good job. Now, what does he need? Um, he needs companionship. He needs a friend. Do we want to buy him a friend? No, right? We don't want two dogs wrecking up our yard, right? And we can't really let him out all the time because, you know, we're afraid of everything. So what do we do? Uh, every day when we get home from work, we reach out of our little back porch and we say, sorry, good boy, right? So there's his need for companionship. Now, is that what Herbert needs? We'll talk about this more. What does he need? No, he wants sacks. What do we do? Nope. We snap off the little hairy bean bags, right? We fix him, right? But does he still need sex? Of course he still needs sex, right? Now, pause there for a terrible story, right? Please skip this portion if you are a decent human being, right? But for those of you who are just terrible people like me, a little quick story. Is it very likely that, right, Herbert sublimates his need for sex. He needs more than just you're saying he's a good boy. Now, is he happy to see you? Oh, of course, he loves to see you when his tail wags, but he's miserable most of the time. So he replaces his real need for companionship, because you won't let him around other dogs except for every other month at the dog park. So he uses his little Fifi the Chew toy as a companion, and you know he does. And he uses the Fifi the Chew toy as a sex companion, when he's not humping the neighbor's kids bad, right? Isn't that insane? We say he's bad. He's just doing what dogs do, and we're like, wrong, bad dog. No, he's a dog. Anyway, do dogs, like humans, sometimes sublimate their needs for things like sex? Yes, they do, right? Terrible story. Skip ahead if you're a good person. When I was first uh, dating my wife, right, and then when we were engaged, her family, when she was living with her, with her parents, we would go off to college, come back and live with our parents for the summer. When she lived with her parents, they had a little pug named Treasure. Now, imagine what a pug is. Yes, right now you're imagining a baby pug, a little puppy, and they are super cute. What are adult pug pugs like? The opposite. They are the most disgusting creatures ever engineered by human beings. They can't breathe. They have bad backs. They have bad skin, right? They are miserable creatures. They smell bad digestion. They are just Frankenstein's monster. Anyway, so this disgusting adult pug had a sublimated sex drive. And his sex companion wasn't a cute little Fifi toy like our Herbert. It was a gigantic stuffed carnival pig. You know what you get at carnivals. Big, cheap, made in Taiwan, right, things. Just, and it was. It was like four times larger than him. And he would hump this thing. He would go to town on this thing. It was so hideous. Now, here's what would happen for fun. We need this as a metaphor. My brother-in-law, before he became a boarding in Christian, was a nice guy and was hilarious. What he would do is he would train, sorry, treasure, I almost called him Herbert. He would train this pug to get off on having sex with the pig by encouraging what is called voyeurism. He would give the giant pig to treasure and then encourage it to hump the dog. Go treasure, good boy, right? Oh, and he would mount this big pig. Anyway, the best parts is when company would come over. Because when company would come over, right, 
my mother-in-law would hide the pig, right? Because she didn't want him humping in front of the, the guests. But Uncle B, right? My brother-in-law, he would hide the pig until the people were over and then throw it to the dog and yell, hit that treasure. And then, <laughs> sorry, and then treasure would mount the pig and go crazy, right? Because he had trained him, conditioned him to like to be watched when he was having sex. I'm so sorry. It's brilliant. And because pugs are incredibly unhealthy, he is nearly killing himself in his performance. <laughs> trying to hump the pig. And my mother-in-law is trying to keep the dog away from the pig. No, no. It was the best. Now, this is a, a illusion, a premonition of where we're going to go in a second. Because we will see humping a stuffed pig so other people can see you is pretty much a metaphor for most of your lives. You are doing things that are creepy and artificial. Your tattoos and eyebrows and piercings and doing all these fake things and being a fake person online or in person just so other people will watch you. You are sublimating your needs for expression and acceptance. But when you look at it objectively, it's like you're humping a stuffed pig to get people's attention. So that will be our metaphor. Whenever we're talking, I will say, oh, did you hump your stuffed pig today? And that will mean, did you get online? Did you get a new tattoo? Did you put on your makeup to get your artificial attention? All right. Sorry. That was terrible. Back to our story. So please rejoin us now if you are a decent person. Okay? So what do we find? Now, what happens is Herbert seems happy, but he has these dreams when he goes to sleep. And they are great dreams, but he wakes up sad. So we draw this little bubble, right? This is what dream life or thought looks like, right? What a good drawing this is. But let's go look at his dreams for a little bit. Well, notice, we replaced all his needs, but he dreams about his real needs. He dreams about what? He dreams about real hunting, chasing real rabbits, running around real trees, drinking from real streams. Yes, that's a stream. Stop it <laughs> about my drawing. He dreams about, let's see, draw South America and put a T in it. He dreams about a steak, real food, not this goofy kibble stuff. And then what does he dream about? Can you guess what this is? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Look carefully. That's dog porn. He dreams about real sex, right? Sniffing real buttholes and, right? Having real sex, real companionship, having buddies he can run and hunt with in the fields. Good. All right. Does he wake up? Yes. And he wakes up and he's sad because he realizes, right? I have all these instincts, I have these real desires for these real things, and I don't have them. I have my little chew toy, I have my little dog run, but I want real stuff. I want my real needs met. And so what does he do, right? He finds a way, like maybe we trust him and take off his bad faith dog collar, or maybe he finds a way to gnaw it off of him, and he escapes. Now what happens when he escapes? Well, he finds that he is not conditioned to get his real needs. He doesn't know how to get them. He doesn't know how to hunt. He doesn't know how to find friends, and they're not around. Hopefully, he doesn't get hit by a car, because he's not used to this, because this is super unnatural, right? And so what happens? He comes back. He comes back, and we're like, oh, great, Herbert. Where did you go? We were worried about you. Why does he come back? Because he doesn't know how to get his real needs met. He is not conditioned for these things. He is conditioned to be satisfied by these artificial versions of his real needs. So he comes back to his fake food, his fake sex, his fake companionship, because that's all he knows. Now, let's fill out the metaphor. What would you say? Why don't you go out there and meet your real needs? Why do you accept fake acceptance from Twitter and from Instagram? Why do you accept fake expression like having a new pair of shoes and retro Jordans or whatever you get? Why do you accept that stuff? Because you've been conditioned to accept it. You have been used to having artificial versions of your real needs. And why don't you escape? Well, here's the bad faith caller. 
You have all sorts of reasons for why you don't seek a better job, why you don't study what you want. Why don't you express yourself truly but just do it in fake ways? You get on your bad faith dog collar and say, I have to work because I have to have a cell phone. I have to have this car and I have to buy a new car. And you say, because it's more reliable, but you're lying. You need the new car because that's how you artificially need your meet your need for acceptance. And you have some ridiculous car, you hump your stepped pig, right? And that what does that mean? So now, this will make sense of the first little passage from Marcuse. So turn to Marcuse, page one, go about two-thirds down the page. The middle paragraph is, is begins such new modes. Let's go to the last sentence of that paragraph and then into what is technically the fourth paragraph, right? So here we are. The most effective and enduring form of warfare against liberation. Fancy words. What are the best ways to prevent people from being liberated or free? The most effective forms is the implanting of material and intellectual needs that perpetuate, perpetuate obsolete forms of the struggle for existence. Read. Keep reading the next paragraph. We may distinguish both true and false needs. False are those which are superimposed upon the individual by particular social interests in his repression. The needs which perpetuate toil, aggressiveness, misery, and injustice. That sounds like our society. They should write that on the Statue of Liberty. That's pretty much us. Their satisfaction might be most gratifying to the individual. Now, pause there. So, first, what is he saying? The best way to keep people from being free is to give them artificial versions of their real needs and then just make these things expensive so that they are desperate to meet these real needs. In fact, a larger point Marcuse is making, and this is crazy to think about, is he is saying, so Marx wrote his Alienated Labor in 1844, and we just imagine Carl the coal miner, right, to see how bad alienation is. Alienation is. Well, what is Marcuse saying? He is saying things are worse now. I know that sounds absurd. You don't have black lung. Maybe you have some carpal tunnel. You, you work in well-lit places. You push buttons, right, and talk to customers and say the same thing over and over. You're not dying of black lung. But Marcuse is saying things are worse now because people will fight for their oppression. They won't fight against it. They'll fight for it. If I say, here, what should we have? Should we have cell phones or health care? And you will say, oh my gosh, I need an iPhone to come out every year, and I'm going to wait in line for it. But I'm not going to protest about health care. No, I need my artificial needs met. Anyway, come back to it. He says, their satisfaction might be most gratifying to the individual. I like this. Because a lot of people, and I will sometimes make this mistake, will say, look how miserable you are with your new iPhone. And you're thinking, that's totally wrong. My new iPhone makes me so happy. Look at it, it has three phones that I don't need. All of this tech that I will never use, but look at how great it is and look how happy I am. Uh, for a little while at least, and then you're going to need a new one because it's not a real self, right? But we'll talk about this when we get to from. But notice... You are genuinely happy when you get these things. When you bring home the chew toy, oh my gosh, Herbert's ecstatic, right? Yes, this is the best thing ever. Keep going. Their satisfaction might be most gratifying to the individual, but this happiness is not a condition which has to be maintained and protected if it serves to arrest the development of the ability, his own and others, to recognize the disease of the whole and grasp the chances of curing the disease. The result, then, is euphoria in unhappiness. Notice this, right? People are euphoric with their new iPhones. They're euphoric with their beer and going to the gym, right? Now, what does this mean? They have, like, the giddy, giddy happiness of being high, always distracted by the new Netflix series, right? Oh, I'm so happy. But they're genuinely unhappy on the inside. This is why they drink so much and are so sad or on so many clinical depression drugs. But they seem happy and act happy. Let read farther. Most of the prevailing needs to relax, to have fun, to behave and consume in accordance with the advertisements, to love and hate what others love and hate, belong to this category of false needs. Now notice this. Do we need to relax? Not really. We need sleep, right? 
do I need to relax a lot? Yeah, well, you would say, Jeff, relax. <laughs> Stop getting so excited. But I'm genuinely excited because I love doing this stuff. I love these ideas. Do we need to have fun? Well, not as a separate thing from our actual activities. I am having fun all the time, and it's part of what I do. It's part of my real work. It's not a distraction from work. My work is fun. Anyway, so we see the best form of oppression is what? Give people expensive artificial versions of their real needs, and they will work terrible jobs to afford them. And they will find them gratifying, but really will have the kind of deep unhappiness like Herbert has. But it's all you know, and your bad faith keeps you in your little backyards. And so what sort of a mouth should we put on Herbert, right? What should he look like? There we go. He is giddy with happiness at least as long as people are watching. He is miserable, but he puts on this fake smile of the robot he's supposed to be. Look at how happy I am because you're here. And then he's miserable most of the time when no one's watching, right? Does he have a little Facebook page? Sorry, that's your grandmother's. Does he have an Instagram page where he makes people think he's great and perfect and happy and all his relationships are great? Yes, we need to get Herbert an Instagram story. I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm so sorry. How on earth does anyone think I'm a good teacher? This is so weird. I'm such a dork. All right. Last of our pictures. Right? Some of you, again, are saying no. Right? Others of you are, this is fun. It is fun if you draw with me. And yes, you can draw the, your pictures much better than mine, but please follow the archetypes. All right. So now we need our third work structure. We need a contemporary work structure. So let's go to Marge, the manager. So Marge is supposed to sound a little bit like Marcuse to help you remember it. But so this is Marge, the manager. Here she is. Now, what does she look like? Yes, I'm great at drawing. Let's see, so we got to give her hair. Well, what is the hairstyle of a modern successful woman? It's whatever popular hairstyle is on the most popular TV show at the time. It's fun. Keep, keep track of that. Uh, here, we'll give her this little skirt dress thingy. I'm sorry, right? But I'm sure it's highly fashionable. Uh, okay, let's fill in what she needs. Uh, she also needs shoes. Shoes are important. W what's popular today, right? Because they make you get a whole new style of shoe, a whole new fit of jeans, different size sunglasses every season, or you're old and out of touch, right? So give her these cloggy heels, right? Oh, that's perfect drawings. But let's see, what else does she need? Okay, she needs her tools. What are her basic tools? Does she need a pickaxe? Does she need a hammer? No, she needs a phone, super expensive phone. And what's this? Her coffee. She needs a coffee. She needs artificial stimulants so that she can act happy and stay alert while she's bored to death. All right, let's see. Let's see, what else does she need? She needs a desk with two monitors, right? Way better tech than she will ever need or use, right? But that's how it works. Right? You all have much better tech than you could ever need. Right? She has a computer that a gamer would dream of. Good. Just in case. Uh, fine. Now, we need a whole bunch of colleagues now. So in reality, I would draw hundreds of people and they're all in some big hierarchy. We're not back at George where everyone's pretty much the same, right? Except for one person who we'd never even see. And they're not just two classes anymore like we had with Carl. It's not Bob, right? The evil boss and everyone else is poor and dying. Now there's gradations everywhere. And everyone is trying to fight and jostle to be above their little level they are. So we need a big hierarchy of positions. So here's Marge the manager. And then here we'll have Ash 3. Sorry, sorry. We need to give her a cool name. So notice, her name is Ash 3. Yes, and she'll be mad if you say it wrong. If you call her Ashley when she introduces herself, she'll get all huffy and say, no, it's Ash 3. Say it right. And yes, you will name your kids like this. You're going to run out of names, right? Celebrities have stopped, are going to run out of calling their kids tree and fig leaf and so forth and table. And they're going to start naming their kids. Ooh, right? Didn't um, Elon Musk just do this? Yes. We need numbers and digits and dashes as part of our names. And yes, my favorite, sorry, sorry, brief tangent. 
I had a friend who was doing kind of advanced sociology and she came across someone, right, who named their daughter, I'm not joking, clitoris. She pronounced it clitoris, right, not realizing what this was. It was so fun. Fast forward if you're a decent person because when I heard this, I imagined, I pretended that I had a daughter with this, with this name in my house for, the, for a whole day. Drove my family crazy. I started saying things like, Clitoris, quit hiding from me. Get over here. Clitoris, quit, quit being, do you really have to be this sensitive? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Please, welcome back. If you're a decent person, you skip that part. All right, so come back. So there's Ash 3, and what does she look like? Yes, there she is. She has her phone. She has her same outfit. Now, maybe she wears her Chuck Taylors to be a rebel, right? And notice her haircut, right? It's asymmetrical, right? Because she's radical. How will you know she won't be successful? Because of those things and because of her name. If you want your kids to be successful, you give them a boring, silly name like Marge right? If you want them to always be an assistant and be cool and hip, right? Then you name them something like Ash 3, right? Okay, great. You will name your kids Ash 3, by the way, or something like it. I predict it. And right now you're laughing. I will laugh later. All right. Who else do we need? We need a huge hierarchy, but we'll just use a couple. So we'll go to sue the CEO. Now, Give her the same hairstyle as Marge, right? Give her the same outfit, same shoes. She has a similar phone. She has her coffee just the way she likes it because that's how she expresses herself with her coffee order at Starbucks. All right, <laughs> now let's think. Now let's talk about them a little bit before we go on and talk about Marge. What is interesting about these people? They all have the same stuff. Now, they will tell you it's different right? They will tell you that their phone is special, but objectively, it's the same, right? Do they have the same outfit? Yes, objectively, it's the same outfit, but did Sue pay more for hers than Marge did? Did Ash 3, did she find hers on sale somewhere? But are they objectively the same? Yes. Do they actually cost nearly the same to make? Yes, right? All right. <laughs> Are they made in the same factory in Cambodia, in China? Yeah, they are. But we think they're different. Do they drive pretty much the same car? Of course. Ash 3 has, what, a Camry. Marge has, what, a Mercedes. Sue has, what, an Audi. Which is the better car? Probably the Camry, right? But they don't care, right? This is the same car, but not to them. They will make incredible differences. Right now, you have a teenage son, sorry, and that son can tell you the difference between their cars. That son could see that a different Audi going down the road, passing you at 30 miles per hour, and tell you exactly which one it is. That's clinical insanity. It is not important that that one's different than that one, but we really memorize these differences. We see an iPhone with a slightly different color, and we know that that color means it costs that much, and that person should be that much more proud of it. That's crazy. So now let's discuss Marge and discuss, like we did with our other laborers, with our other workers in history, let's go through what it's like to be her and then discuss how she's doing on her needs. So please fill out the chart like you've been doing, right? Here's a little outline, but please fill in whatever you're thinking about. Remember, reminder, in philosophy classes, your notes are not just what I write on the board. You are writing down anything that might be helpful. You're writing down what you're thinking about. You're writing down, if you think I have a story that helps you or an example that helps you, write that down. Your notes should contain as much as your ideas as things I write or say. And especially because this is video, you need to take a lot of notes because I can't write down everything. So we'll go in the order we went into before. So what is, how does Marge relate to her product, right? Remember, we'll start there to make it easier. Well, right there, you see a problem. There is no product. Notice that when we talked about her, nobody felt the need to talk about what she actually does, who her actual company is that she worked for, what they do, because it doesn't matter. 
Have you noticed how these sorts of managers and executives can go back and forth from very different sorts of companies? They can work for the Red Cross, and then they can work in the White House, and then they go work for BMW, and then they go and work for Nazi Germany. Sorry, sorry. They go work for terrible things and good things. It doesn't matter because the managing is the same, right? The work is not important except as managing people. And so what is produced doesn't matter at all. And so she doesn't produce anything. So write that down first. But she must produce something. And so let's say, uh, draw in. Here, go back to your Marge the Manager picture and draw in an extra little piece of paper on her desk. And this will be whatever it is that she works on. Maybe it's a spreadsheet, maybe it's a budget, maybe it's a series of memos. I don't know, managerial prerogatives and action items. I love Fight Club. Whatever it is, that's something she works on. Let's say she produces this document, this report, uh, every quarter, every month, who knows, whatever it is. Now, let's talk about that as her product. She really has none, so make sure you make a note of that. But how does she feel about this form, this budget, this spreadsheet? Let's call it an XJ7 for whatever it's worth. It always has some weird name. How does she feel about that? Because that's what she works on all the time. What does she think of it? Does she bring it home and put it on the fridge to show her family? Of course not. If you put her XJ7 in a warehouse full of XJ7s, could she find hers? No, not if she did it right. It should look exactly like her last one and like every other person's. Clear? Yeah. How does she feel about that? Doesn't. Does she resent this? Yes. Does it cause her, cause her a lot of stress? Yes. We could say this about a lot of things in her life. It seems really mundane and boring and the same thing over and over, but it's highly stressful. Why? Because she doesn't like doing it. Fine. How does she feel about an XJ7? Let's get to the psychology. She can't express herself in this. She doesn't gain acceptance from it. She's not proud of it. Now, she's glad it's done, but it's repetitive and stressful. She does not see herself in this form. If, they, if a little kid asks her, what do you do for a living? She doesn't say, I do this. I do this XJ7. No, she doesn't want to see that as a reflection of her and her skills. Good. Next, her colleagues. Now, let's think about this. I want you to answer this before I do in your head. How does she relate to her coworkers? Does she care about them? Not in any deep sense. These relationships are, think about it, fairly random. And it has very little to do with the work. She likes some of her co-workers and doesn't like others. Now, everything's a hierarchy. She probably even knows how much each one gets paid. And so she feels that she should be competing with that one. That one's beneath her. But what is it based on? Usually stupid things. Does she really think so-and-so deserves a promotion? Hardly. And why does she like some of them? Because they watch the same TV shows. Because they have the same style of automobile or like the same shoes. They're both Broncos fans or like the same jokes. It has almost nothing to do with the work. Think about it in your life. Do you like some of your coworkers and dislike others? And is this fairly random? Do you like some of them because they're hard workers? And you like some of them because they're terrible workers, but they're hilarious. Exactly. The work is tangential to the relationships, right? It's just social class. How does she relate to her boss, Sue, the CEO? Again, this could be all over the place. She could respect her. She could admire her. She could resent her. Does she often say, I could do her job? Yes, and she probably could. The relationship, again, is based on usually trivial things. How funny is Sue the CEO? How intense is she? Does she help her out? I don't know. It could be based on tons of things and it usually only is tangential to how good Sue is as a boss. Another key here is that Marge thinks of Sue and her as pretty much the same. She thinks of them as equals. Thus, they have similar phones, drink similar coffees, have similar clothes, right? They're very similar. 
And this is what Marge thinks, and so can't believe that Sue makes a lot more money than her. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Although maybe she admires her and wants to follow in her footsteps, but the difference in pay? Well, why? They're doing the same thing. Now let's talk about Marge's place in the community. How does she feel about the society as a whole? Do her neighbors know what she does? They might know what she works, who she works for, but they have no idea what her job is. How important is her job to her neighbors? How important is her job to her community? Not at all. It has no impact whatsoever on her society. She could do 30,000 different jobs. They would have the same effect, almost none on her society. What is her effect on her society? A consumer, she lives in that house with that car, looks this way, and that's how she relates. She might relate by her salary or title, because that's what she introduced herself as when she's getting drunk on red wine on Friday nights, but the actual work itself has nothing to do with the society. People might say, oh, there's Marge the manager, but her work has no effect. Now, go back up to the difficult parts. Activity. What do you imagine her workday is like? Is she watching the clock? Of course she's watching the clock. What is the workday like? It's, rep it's repetitive and stressful, but objectively it looks easy. Now, there's a lot of emotional stress because of the pressure of the job, because of how much money she makes and how many people she controls. So she's got a lot of political maneuvering to do. But the work itself objectively doesn't look very hard. She's typing some things, answering some texts, right? It doesn't look difficult, but it's stressful and repetitive. It's intense and boring at the same time. It is weird. Is she expressing herself personally? Of course not. She constantly has this thought at work that they don't know the real me. Nobody knows the real me. She has to act like everyone else. Does she express herself in her hairstyle? I guess so. <laughs> it's so absurd. But what is the activity like? Repetitive and stressful. There is no room for real expression. Finally, how does she feel about herself? When she looks in the mirror, what does she think? Now, this is where it gets weird. Because she drinks a lot. She might even be on antidepressants. But how does she feel about herself? She looks in the mirror and she's proud and wonders, why aren't I happy? Why am I so sad and miserable? And why am I so competitive and stressed all the time? And she doesn't know. Because she knows she should be proud of herself because look at her title, look at her car, look at her clothes. But she's unhappy and wants to be something else. Super weird, but she talks herself out of this all the time. Now turn to how Marge is doing in terms of the needs that we have been listing. This is where we'll see what Marcuse's key points are. So first, how is she doing on her, in terms of her biological and physiological needs? Now think about it, because I want you to get under the basic surface of, surface, surface, sorry, of this. At first, we would say that she's doing fine. And of course she is. She has a house, she has food, she has water, access to health care, all of these things that a lot of people don't have because she's successful. But think deeper than that. How is she doing on her needs for things like food and shelter? Think about it. These are neurotically overmet. She is stressed about these things, even though she shouldn't be giving them a thought at all. Does she worry about her diet? Does she go on a different diet every few months? She's keto, and then she's vegetarian, and then she's going to... A Whole Foods and spending a fortune on asparagus water. Yes, she is always on a different diet to try to be more healthy. Is her need for shelter completely overmet? Yes, to the point where this stuff makes her stressed. Does she constantly watch decorator shows, flip this house and HGTV shows, and is constantly unhappy about her couch cushions or the curtains on her windows? Does she want a different house all the time? Yes. So her physiological needs cause her stress because she has a neurotic relationship to them. 
because they are not for meeting her basic needs. They're for meeting her psychological needs. She needs to look a certain way to gain the acceptance she wants. She needs her house to be a certain way because that's how she thinks she expresses herself and gets other people to respect her or, in terms of needs, accept her. So this stuff gets neurotic. How is she doing on her negative needs? How is she doing on her needs for security and feeling safe and having enough money? Again, she should be great, but no. She is worried about crime. She's worried about terrorism. She's worried about, now, the, this pandemic of COVID is a real issue, but she was she also worried about the Ebola virus and swine flu and vaccinating her children? Yes. She's freaked out about all of this. She feels incredibly insecure, and she can never have enough money. Again, neurotic. She is out of touch in a, in a moderate way with the reality of things, and so she's incredibly insecure. Next, how is she doing on her need for love? Again, this is so sad. How many husbands has she probably had? Probably a few. Why? Now, you will be able to give me a bunch of good diagnoses for why. You'll have a bunch of great theories, but let me try a new one on you. She is incredibly dissatisfied with her companionship and her needs for love and people to care for her and care for others because she doesn't realize why she's unhappy. She is unhappy because all of her other needs, but she blames it on her partner. She has this idea, and movies don't help, that your partner is supposed to make you fully satisfied in life. What's the idea? Your partner's job is singular, to care for you and to love you. But you mistake your partner's job to be fulfilling all of your needs. This is for men, sorry heterosexual women, thanks for jumping on that grenade of heterosexuality so that we can survive as a species. But Men think their women should give them their need for acceptance. That you need to respect them and make them feel important in the world. No, you morons. Your wife's job is only to love you, not to meet all of your needs. How does Marge feel? Yeah, she feels like her husband isn't doing enough because she doesn't feel acceptance. She doesn't feel like people listen to her expression. When really, he should just be there to care for her. But she is unsatisfied and someone has to take the blame here. How is she doing on her need for love? Pretty terribly. Also because she can't be herself, and she's incredibly stressed at her job and takes that out on her partner. Next, how is she doing on her need for expression? This is where it gets really fun. Does she have real expression? Does she express what she thinks and feels? No, not at all. She is a fake self almost 24-7, and she probably brings it home with her. She is probably fake at home, too. Is she probably fake with her friends? Yes. She might have that one friend that she calls who lives on the other side of the country who she can be real with, but everyone else she's fake with. But if you ask her, how is she doing on her need for expression? She would say she's doing great, but she's not because it's all artificial expression. She is expressing a fake self or some lifestyle that she has chosen, and she thinks that's expressing her. When she picks the color of her car, when she puts a case on her cell phone, when she gets the haircut that she found from Game of Thrones, she feels like she's expressing herself, but it's artificial, so it's not satisfying. Next, how is she doing on her need for acceptance? Not. She is not being accepted for who she really is in the real choices she makes, in the real skills she has. She is being accepted, again, for her clothes, her title, her salary, her couch cushions, her curtains, right, her tattoos. Not things that are real that she has done. Not for the choices she makes or who she really is. So it's fake, and so she thinks it's met, but she doesn't feel this way. She knows she is sad and doesn't feel like people genuinely express her for who she is. Next, purpose. What is her purpose? What? Promotion. Her purpose is to get an Audi. Her purpose is to live in that gated community someday. Her purpose is promotion, vacation, retirement. 
And these aren't satisfying. She gets to the promotion, and within a month, it's worn off. Yes, it's gratifying for a short time, but these aren't human purposes. She is not really getting better at skills that she finds desirable. Her meaning in life is to get her promotion at a company that has no real significance in the world when she looks around and sees the real world for what it is. But does she mistake these other purposes for her meaning? Sure. And does she then go to church as a sort of self-help to make her feel that her life has purpose? Right? Does she have a purpose-driven life because she's a better Christian this week than she was last week? She probably feels these things. But in her deep self, is she satisfied with these as genuine human purposes? I really doubt it. So, let's go back to Marge. What should we draw her as? Of course, she has a big smile on her face until she is at home drinking her red wine, taking her antidepressants, and then it's, what? Euphoria and unhappiness. We get it. Is this what we see around us? Yes. My dad. My dad is now dying of anorexia, dementia. What did he tell me the other day? Gosh, you guys, this is crazy. He said, is this what all of my hard work was for? This is awful. He is terribly sad, and he was sad the whole time. I'm the only one in my family that is genuinely happy and has been happy this whole time, and I didn't follow this archetype like they did. Damn. So now let's go back to the reading. What we are doing now is what Marcuse is really good at, and that is showing us how this is a new form of alienation. Remember, the critical theorists take these ideas and apply them, adapt them, correct their mistakes, and show how they apply now. So what Marcuse is going to do is take the concept of alienation and show us how it still applies, but the key now is that it's hidden. So when he says that things are worse now than they were for Carl the coal miner, at first it's hard to believe him. But we ask this sort of a question. What is worse? Is it worse to be a slave fighting for your freedom or be a slave who's fighting to maintain your slavery? The idea here is the worker is still completely alienated, but they can't see it. And so they don't even fight for this. In fact, they fight to maintain their alienation. All right, so look at it. In the first sense, we've already seen a part of this, so let's talk about it. The first reason why Marge or the worker today can't see their alienation is because they're too busy to see it. They are too busy trying to keep up with their artificial needs that they can't even imagine a different way that life could be. By the way, that's what the title of this means. The piece is called One Dimensional Man, and the key idea is we can't imagine a different world at all, so we can't do anything about it. We can't make our lives better because we think our lives are as good as it gets. Here's the idea. We could go to Marge and we could say, you know what, Marge, it's your job that's making you depressed and so stressed out. Why don't you go get a different job? And she would tell you, she can't, right? A better job that she might get, sorry, a job that would be more satisfying wouldn't be able to keep with her, up with her artificial needs. Let's talk about this. Let's call this the cycle of false needs and alienation. Let's go through the steps. Step one. We're back to Herbert the dog. You have artificial needs. You need to spend money to get these needs met. You need a car, you need clothes. Now, of course, what does this mean? You need to work. And can the worker today ever have enough money? No. You need to work as much as possible because why? Right, so now go through the cycle. You have artificial needs that are expensive and so you must work. But these needs are artificial, and so they're not really satisfied. You are not meeting your needs through genuine creative activity. You are consuming things. You are trying to express yourself with your hair. You're trying to gain acceptance because of your car or your phone. And what do you find? These aren't very satisfying in the long term, so they aren't satisfying and need to be replaced. What does this mean? You need to replace these things you've consumed, so 
you have to work more and more. And now look at work. Work is alienating and dissatisfying of your real needs, and so it increases your dissatisfaction. Notice how we explained alienation in a way that showed its direct effect on your key needs for expression and acceptance. So what happens in the spiral? So now someone like Marge is further alienated by her job and so must replace those needs with more false needs and the cycle repeats. The false needs require you to overwork. The alienation increases your need for these false things, and so you must buy more, and the cycle repeats, and most people are in debt trying to keep up with the cycle. That's right. She can't see her alienation because she's too busy trying to afford her artificial needs. Let's read this part in, Mar in Marcuse's words, right? So, first part of alienation, she's too busy. Now look what he says. Very bottom of page one. Here the social controls exact the overwhelming need for the production and consumption of waste. The need for stupefying work where it is no longer a real necessity. Notice, she works to get an Audi, to get a bigger house, to redecorate her kitchen, not for things she really needs. The need for modes of relaxation which soothe and prolong the stupefaction. Does she desperately need a vacation? Yes. The need for maintaining such deceptive liberties as free competition at administered prices, a free press which censors itself, free choice between brands and gadgets. Here's the real point. Next paragraph, so second paragraph, page two. The range of choice open to the individual is not the decisive factor in determining the degree of human freedom, but what can be chosen and what is chosen by the individual. Free choice among a wide variety of goods and services does not signify freedom if these goods and services sustain social controls over a life of toil and fear, that is, if they sustain alienation. Talk about that. How many different careers could you have? How many different things could you be in life? Tons. You could have tons of different careers, be tons of different things, but you won't. Why? Because of what we said. Problem one, you are too busy and too in debt of art affording your artificial needs to really make a different choice. But what are you going to do? You are going to select the major that will take you the fewest amount of years to get you the highest salary. If there is a job that is more meaningful with lower salary, you will not pick it because you need to keep up with the cycle of false needs. All right, I need to stop preaching. I'm so sorry. Right? Some of you like this. I'm sorry. Some of you don't. Next way her alienation is hidden. Let's let Marcuse say it, and then we'll talk a little bit. We are now in what's technically the third paragraph, although it's not indented on page two. Here, the so-called equalization of class distinctions reveals its ideological function. If the worker and his boss enjoy the same television program and visit the same resort places, if the typist is as attractively made up as the daughter of her employer, if the Negro, sorry, that was the cool word at that day, saying Negro was progressive at this time when Marcuse is writing, if the Negro owns a Cadillac, if they all read the same newspaper, then this assimilation indicates not the disappearance of classes, but the extent to which the needs and satisfaction that serve the preservation of the establishment are shared by the underlying population. Notice this. We can no longer see the inequalities in society. Why? Because we all have the same values, all have the same tastes. If everyone has an iPhone, then it must be all equal. Sure, you don't have quality health care, but you have the same phone as rich people have, and your car looks expensive. And so what do you do? I'm not going to vote for things that are good for me. I'm going to vote for things that are good for the upper classes because I identify with them. I have the same brands and gadgets that they do, so I must be rich, I must be successful, I must be equal. Do you get it? Third reason that she can't see her alienation is because, we'll say it this way, no one is responsible. Try this one. Let's just read a little short piece. So after the break, this is technically the fourth paragraph on page two, a little break, it says this. Domination is transfigured into administration. 
The capitalist bosses and owners are losing their identity as responsible agents. They are assuming the function of bureaucrats in a corporate machine. So let's go back to Marge and Sue. What would happen if Marge goes to Sue and says, you know what, I am just really tired of this XJ7. I am so sorry, but it is incredibly alienating and it is meaningless. I don't think it makes a difference to anyone. It doesn't have any purpose. And now let's say that Sue is a bad boss. We'll make her a good boss in a second. If she's a bad boss, she would simply say, well, I could find thousands of people who would want your salary and would gladly do that job. Yeah, let's say she's a bad boss and that's what she says. All right, that's not very nice. Let's say she's a good boss. What should, would she say? She would take this to the stockholders and say, hey, stockholders, what do you think of getting rid of the XJ7 memo spreadsheet budget because the managers really dislike doing it? Well, what are the stockholders going to do? They're going to say, well, what are profit margins like? Are we getting enough dividends to the stockholders? Right? What did they, and they would say, yes, dividends are good. They would say, then don't change a thing. Ooh, dividends are bad. Well, let's start firing people because that's the best way to get stocks to go up. So yes, let's downsize. Again, right? Does it make a difference to the stockholders? And who are they? Stockholders change all the time and they're the ones that we're worried about in our decision making. All right, go to another one. Let's say Sue is a really good boss. What will she do? Here is what a really good boss would do. She would say to Marge, Marge, I know it's terrible, but we have to do it. And one day you will have my job and wait till you see an XJ8. It is five more pages of meaningless gibberish. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to have more casual Fridays. That's what we're going to do. And here are some movie passes. Here are some red wine coupons. I, I hope we can make this as fun as possible. Exactly. Here's a corporate retreat in Bermuda. That's how you deal with it. Now, what if Marge really says, no, this is all terrible. What is she going to do about it? It's systemic. It would require a revolution. No one is to blame. It's not Sue's fault. You can't even blame the stockholders. This is just how the system works. It's there to maximize profit. You need to manage people, and this is the most efficient way to do it. You can't change it without blowing the whole thing up. And if you blow the whole thing up, then you don't get an Audi. You don't get an iPhone anymore. And that's how you meet your needs. So you don't want that at all. It's systemic. You can't blame. There is no Bob that if you murder Bob and take over the coal mine, it would be different. No, you would just be the CEO and nothing would change. Fourth and finally, my favorite of them. She cannot see her alienation because she doesn't have the ability to think. She can't think in concepts, and so she can't critique anything. She can't do critical thinking because she has no ideals. Let's look at Marcuse. Last six lines, seven lines of the whole piece. And if the individuals are preconditioned so that the satisfying goods also include thoughts, feelings, aspirations, why should they wish to think, feel, and imagine for themselves? True, the material and mental commodities offered may be bad, wasteful rubbish, but spirit, sorry, that's what Geist means, but spirit and knowledge are no telling arguments against satisfaction of needs. So pause. If you told her we need to change this whole thing, you are alienated, she would say, what? No cell phone? No Audi? Forget it. I am sticking to my cell phone and my Audi. Come back. This language which constantly imposes images militates against the development and expression of concepts. In its immediacy and directness, it impedes conceptual thinking, thus it impedes thinking. Notice. You need ideals and concepts so that you can look at your everyday reality and say, this isn't good enough. Think back to the cave and the forms. You need to be able to say, here's what justice is, its real sense, so that I can look at the world and say, this isn't just. Why do we need philosophy? Because it trades in ideals and concepts. 
We need to understand what things like socialism is and what alienation is so that we can say our world could be better. But Marge doesn't have this ability. She doesn't have ideals and concepts. She only has images. So she can't look at these images and see, I need to change my life. No, because the images are her life. That must be the good life. Let's try this. Let's try a little exercise. You are going to close your eyes, and I am going to say a very important concept, and you are just going to think about it. Good? And let's see what thoughts you come up with. Good. And these will be important ideas. So, I am going to close my eyes, and you are going to close my eyes and think of this idea. Ready? Freedom. 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 Open your eyes. What did you get? And notice, freedom is one of our basic needs. That's what we mean when we say free expression. Being able to do and say what you think and feel. Well, what did you get when you closed your eyes? Most of you got fireworks and bald eagles and American flags and the 4th of July. Maybe you got an open field or something like this. I don't know. Maybe you got leaving your job that day or something. These are all images. These do not allow us to think. Because we can look at our life and say, yep, I have those images, so I must be free. Or, I'm going to take a vacation and that's freedom. No. Let's think about how this would, would work in the world. Let me ask you a question and see what you think of this question. In what ways are Chinese workers more free than American workers? And you couldn't have that conversation because you don't have an idea of what freedom means. You would think of that question and think, well, let's see, Chinese people don't have fireworks and flags and bald eagles. They have some red flag, right? And so they can't be free. Notice, you can't even think about freedom and ways in which you might not be free because you only have images of freedom, not a genuine concept. For instance, is a Chinese worker terrified that if the COVID virus makes them lose their job, they won't have health care anymore? No, this is not a way that affects their freedom. They are not worried about their health care when it comes to how do they choose a different job. Are they worried about going to school too long because they'll have too much debt? No. So in those ways, they are more free. But an American can't even think about those ways because they don't think of freedom in terms of anything but a flag and a bald eagle. Try another one. Okay, so close your eyes and let's do another important concept. Close your eyes. Love. 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 Think about it. All right, open your eyes. What did you get? Hearts, flowers, walking out on the mesa, the ocean, right? Boxes of chocolates, love letters. Yeah. And what do you do with this one? You look at your life and say, oh yeah, that partner that beats me and tells me I'm worth nothing, he does make poems for me and he gives me chocolates and we walked on the sunset sometimes. What does that mean? I must have love. I can't critique my relationship because I don't know what genuine love is. I don't know that genuine love is care for a person and seeking to help them feel secure and cared for in the world. I only have images. So, I can't think. And so, I can't critique my life or see what's wrong with it. 